Welcome back to Math 104. What is the probability of the event there is at least one girl and at least one boy? As always, we can describe this event by writing out all of the individual outcomes that are in the event, all the outcomes that contribute to the event. There are six of them. Since there are eight possible outcomes overall for this experiment, and we are assuming that the outcomes are equally likely, it's just a matter of counting six outcomes in the event divided by eight outcomes overall for the experiment, six eighths, or 0.75, is the probability. As I said in the last video, you're welcome to leave six eighths unsimplified. I realize you were flogged by your middle school teachers to always simplify your fractions, but here it actually makes more sense not to simplify it because we want to keep track of this eight here which really carries information unique to this particular experiment. The other approach is to note that these six outcomes are all except for BBB and GGG. So if eight out of eight is the probability that something happens, and in the long run it is only two eighths of the time that something other than this event happens, if there is only a 2 out of 8 probability that our event doesn't occur, then there is a 6 out of 8 probability that our event does occur. Note that all the probabilities that we're talking about for this experiment, whether 2 out of 8 for not occurring or 6 out of 8 for occurring, have 8 in the denominator. Now wait a minute. Thus far we've talked about performing experiments and finding relative frequencies. So that's one thing that we do sometimes as with that coin flipping experiment at the beginning. But we've also had examples where we declared in advance what the probabilities are. For example, when we declared in advance that all the different birth orders in a family of three are equally likely. So these seem to be two different approaches. So what's the connection? We have to make a distinction between experimental probability and theoretical probability. So what is experimental probability? The point here is that although we talk about the long-term relative frequency with which an event occurs, in practice you cannot flip the coin forever. You cannot repeat an experiment infinitely many times. You cannot find infinitely many families with three children and ask about the birth order. In practice, if you repeat an experiment, the number of times must be finite. In the long run, we're all dead. After an infinite amount of time, the universe will probably have ceased to exist. So in practice, any experiment can be repeated only finitely many times. In an earlier video, we were flipping coins and recording the relative frequency of heads. Each time we computed a relative frequency, we were computing an experimental probability. After the first 10 flips, four tenths of which had come up heads, as of that moment, Based on our experimental data, for all we knew, that coin would continue to come up heads only 40% of the time. We did not know in advance that it was a fair coin. We were just flipping and seeing what happened. We flipped some more, and over time, the experimental probability changed. As we collected more data, we revised our estimate of the overall relative frequency with which heads was occurring. Eventually, after 80 flips, we stopped, for no particular reason. As of the 80th flip, the experimental probability was 0.475. We did not know anything in advance about the likelihood of heads compared to tails, and we did not assume that heads and tails were equally likely. We just gathered experimental data, and after 80 flips, our data suggested that this coin had a 0.475 chance of coming up heads. But what if we do have prior information about the coin before we do any flipping? For example, what if we know for certain, in advance, that the coin has been designed to be perfectly fair? Then 0.5 is the theoretical probability that the coin will show heads when flipped. But it could also be that the coin has been deliberately designed to be weighted to one side, so that heads will have a 60% probability on each flip. Someone could design a coin that way, and they could sell it on the internet as a specialty coin, a trick coin advertised to have a 60% probability of heads on each flip. If so, then 60% is the theoretical probability. 
theoretical because it's information that we have prior to doing any actual flipping. Now, what is the connection between these two notions, experimental probability and theoretical probability? The connection, the crucial connection, between experimental probability and theoretical probability is that if we keep performing the experiment repeatedly, then the experimental probability will eventually get closer and closer to the theoretical probability even if it takes a while. Now that we've thought a bit more carefully about what we mean by probability, let's address an important misconception called the gambler's fallacy. And it's not just gamblers who commit the fallacy, but many gamblers do. Let's suppose that Pat and Sam, who will be two of our favorite characters in this course, have just learned the definition of probability and have the following debate. As background for this debate, Pat has been given a coin guaranteed by the manufacturer to be fair. It really has been engineered to be symmetrical enough that heads and tails are truly equally likely. So for this discussion, there will be no doubt that the probability of heads, the theoretical probability of heads, really is one half. Pat begins the debate by saying, I started flipping the coin, and on the first ten flips I obtained ten tails in a row. But by the definition of probability we just learned, Having probability 0.5 of heads and probability 0.5 of tails means that the fraction of heads which occur should eventually be 0.5, or extremely close to it. Since it's truly a fair coin, it's due for more heads than tails on the upcoming flips, in order for the fraction of heads to rise from 0, where it is now, to something closer to 0.5. These are the key words in Pat's position. The coin is due for more heads than tails to compensate for the extra tails that have already occurred. Sam replies, wait a minute, that can't be right, because the coin does not know what happened in the past. How can it compensate for the previous flips if it doesn't even have a way to remember them? Hmm, many people think like Pat, and many people think like Sam. Think about these two statements. Which one do you find more convincing? Sam is correct. The future flips will not compensate for the past results, but, this is the key point, they will overwhelm them. So how does that work? What does that even mean? Here's a helpful example. Like Pat's fair coin, suppose that your fair coin has given tails every time on the first 10 flips. As of that moment, the relative frequency of heads equals 0 out of 10 which is zero. Suppose that from now on, though, half of all the flips will produce heads, and the other half will produce tails. In other words, we'll really see the fairness of this coin on all the subsequent flips, in spite of the fact that there was a lucky run or an unlucky run of tails at the beginning. Let's just see what effect this will eventually have on the relative frequency of heads. It means that after getting zero heads and ten tails on the first ten flips, so that your relative frequency of heads is zero, on the second ten flips, you're getting five heads and five tails, right? That's just our assumption. We're supposing that after those first ten flips, we get an equal number of heads and tails forever after. What happens when we tally up the total so far? Overall, we now have five total heads. Overall, we have 15 total tails out of 20 total flips. The relative frequency of heads is now five out of 20, or 0.25. What just happened? The relative frequency of heads, the experimental probability of heads thus far, has gone from 0 up to 0.25. If you do another 80 flips, and, by our assumption, half of them are heads and half are tails, we can ask, what will be the new relative frequency of heads for the entire 100 flips you have done thus far? To make sure you understand what we're doing here, please pause the video and try to answer this question before you go on. If the first 10 flips are all tails, but all subsequent flips are half heads and half tails, then after 100 flips, there will have been 45 heads and 55 tails. Right? The first... That's because there are 45 heads and 45 tails on the last 90 flips. That is our assumption. First 10 flips are tails, all the rest are equally divided between heads and tails. 
If that's what happens, the relative frequency of heads, which was 0 after 10 flips and 0.25 after 20 flips, has now jumped to 0.45. This is the key point. The relative frequency of heads isn't climbing all the way to exactly 50%, but it is getting closer as we flip more. Let's continue assuming that the first 10 flips are tails, and on subsequent flips, exactly half are heads and exactly half are tails. Before going on to the next video, answer the following questions. Under these assumptions, if you flip a total of 100,000 times, what will be the relative frequency of heads? And why is the result of this computation important?